How you doing out there? I hope everybody's ready for the show. Number 80. Okay, well, well, wait. Okay, I think it's 82. Oh, it's 82. Welcome to The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How about you? Excellent. And how are you doing out there today? Show 82, here we go. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but one of the last things we do before we go to bed at night is we watch a little TV. Now, not together, but in our own private houses. So I really love sleeping, and I really love falling asleep. For me, it's like the opportunity to think about whatever I want to imagine, I can travel anywhere I want in my dreams at any time period. So I really like sleeping. And because of this, and because I view it as a sleep journey, I'm pretty particular about what I watch before I go to sleep. Like I generally do not watch anything news or politics. And I don't watch something that's really loud, like with sirens and car chases and screaming. I steer clear of that. That's, that doesn't set the stage for a good night's sleep for me. But what about you? What is your bedtime routine? And do you have a favorite TV show that is your go-to? Well, uh, Phyllis is the one that likes to watch movies. I usually watch just sports and news. But when I come downstairs after whatever I'm doing upstairs, a lot of times in the Donics, um, the TV is on. She may or may not be awake. And... Uh, I get into these shows uh, vicariously through her, but one of them was The Big Bang Theory. And there were Sheldon and Leonard, and there was, I don't know, who helped me out. Uh, uh, Howard Amy, and Amy, oh, I don't want all the, I want the Raj. scientists. Raj, Howard, Sheldon, Leonard. They're scientists that play on the show. And then there's some ladies that accompany them. And uh, one of them is a very smart physicist. Anyway, I like that show because, um, I can't really put my finger on it. It's it's easy. It's it's funny. There's a great there's great sense of humor. There's chemistry and there's actions and interactions between this eclectic group of scientists and astrophysicists. I like how they fill up the board with formulas and stuff, and then just their personalities. I like the little funky place they live. I have this impression it's a tower, and there's a center stairway that goes around and around and around. The elevator has been broken ever since I started watching the show. <laughs> Anyway, they come up around the stairs. So a lot of the movie, they're going up and down and up and down. They're just going up and up and up. But another one I've, I've gotten into is PBS's Masterpiece Theater. Phyllis really likes that. And one of them is in Yorkshire, northeast of London. And it's uh, all creatures great and small. So it's a wonderful story about three veterinarians who meet different people in this little wonderful community and save animals' lives. And I kind of like that, too. Uh what I really liked about it, you were talking about melancholy. This is a area of farms and hamlets and incredibly beauty. So I love it when they drive out to help some horse or a cow and you're tr going down these uh, rock lined walls on the highway and their little roads and it's just fabulous. And of course I won't, I'm running out of time, but Poirot is another one a British mystery and um, I like how he walks and he's stealth and he solves things with penetrating uh, perceptions. And uh, oh, uh, yeah, I got the Christie care. Yeah, and he said his walk is nothing more than being able to hold a penny between your cheek buttocks as you walk. So, you know, you can try that on your own and see if you can get that up. Well, I, you? I haven't seen the two shows you were talking about, but I, I have seen The Big Bang Theory. That is very funny. Yeah. So Isaac recently watched the whole s series. Um, for me, for a long time, my go-to, for years, my go-to bedtime TV program was some version of Star Trek. Mm. So I just really love the sound of the space noises. I find it really relaxing. Um, recently, though, in the last few months, my go-to bedtime TV show is Twilight Zone. And I really like what the narr narrator says, the monologue he says at the beginning of every episode. I would want to actually play it for you now, but because of copyright things, I, I guess I'm just going to have to say it myself. 
So well, can you, here I go. Oh, okay. There's a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Wow. I'm ready to lay down and take a nap and through imagination travel into the realm of creativity and possibility. It's That's a, very good. I don't even think I ever get to the finish of any episode. After that, I think I pretty much drift off to sleep after he says a little opener. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to, um, you know, actually, I, I, before we go, I actually just want to recommend a good bedtime TV show. It's the Ruddle Show. Maybe. <laughs> Except maybe they'd have a nightmare if they watched the rant. <laughs> right. Maybe without the rant episode. Okay. Well, we this is our last show of season eight or nine. Our last show of season nine. And let's do it. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's been a while since we've done a fresh perspective segment, so we thought we would do one today. And if you don't remember, I'll remind you. The point of this segment is to challenge you to think of something in a different way than you have maybe up until now. We often accept ideas and claims without really questioning them. So essentially, with this segment, we want to activate your critical thinking skills and get you to think outside the box. Today, we wanted to talk about the advertising claim of fast healing. We want to talk about what actually constitutes fast healing. And if the healing is indeed faster, is it even statistically significant? Wow, that's a good one. Because uh, on earlier shows, as many of you will recall that are show watchers, um, we talked about uh, the laser. And of course, there's all kinds of lasers and wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum of light. But the ones we talked about were really in the nanometer uh, wavelength around 650, if I recall, to about 900, 950, under 1,000. And those laser lights, they're operating in the red infrared zone. Uh, they can pass over many, many wounds, uh, injuries like from basketball or a blow, uh, pathological instances where uh, aphthous ulcers, you know, things like that. Uh, they show and that there's remarkable evidence on rapid healing as compared to just letting uh, a virus or something like a aphthous ulcer just truck along and do its whole course. So they've showed dramatic reductions in inflammation, rapid wound healing, and of course, uh, this makes people happy. So that's that's would be an example. And companies have oftentimes used these slogans to promote either through their products or their technologies to promote that product in the marketplace. So when dentists see fast healing and they look at lasers, that's really something to look into because there's a big, big body of evidence from around the world. It's not just one location that's reporting this. Probably the other classic example I'd like to report is on implants, and I don't do implants. Uh, we all have heard about implants. I talked a little bit about the Brandemark implants way back in the 50s and how they kind of came along and they were titanium is what most of us thought and then they even got coatings but there's this new thing that's being promoted and uh i might just say zimmer biomet they uh got together 30 scientific papers with clinical applications and they have this body of evidence to show this bio boost effect bio boost was the buzzword and the bio boost effect you know i was kind of thinking well what is this some chemicals we're putting in the bone after we drill the hole no it has to do with the implant itself and the implant is called tantalum tantalum it's element 73 in the periodic table and it has characteristics even better than titanium and what has been noticed is it's not a solid implant, nor does it have a surface treatment. It is actually uh, 3D. It, it simulates uh, trabecular bone. So if you have an implant that has trabecular bone in its body, then you can see how 
uh, osteoid and vascularization and precursors for bone formation could rapidly happen. So this is also another really good implant for people who have medical compromises uh, like diabetes. So it's getting a lot of noise and a lot of people are going towards this uh, Zimmer Biomed thing because of the tantalum and, and, and Branamark validated tantalum back in 1950 roughly. Okay, so you gave two examples, the lasers and the implants of advertising, advertisers claiming fast healing. And I just think that, first of all, we just need to clarify, to say that something is, heals fast or, or faster, that implies the existence that there's also slow healing or slower healing. So we just need to keep that in mind. And um, because if you're going to say something's faster, it has to be faster than what? Yeah, right. That's and you true. gave the two examples. And for the first one, the laser example you gave, I have to say that um, it would make sense to me intuitively on an intuitive level. It would make sense that laser uh, procedures done with lasers would heal faster than procedures that use the scalpel. Because that, because without breaking the tissue, you would think that there would be faster healing. So yeah. intuitively, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. With the other example you gave, you um, talked about the implants that have more naturally occurring growth factors. And that would make sense that that would heal faster than implants without those naturally occurring growth factors. And plus, you said that it would... Especially with evidence. And you said there was 30 <laughs> clinical articles that supported it. So right away, when you're trying to assess if a claim rings true or not, you can say, does it intuitively ring true? And then you can answer that question to yourself. Is it supported by evidence-based research? A lot of it then that helps give it credibility. So what would be an example of a problematic advertising claim of fast healing? Well, I guess I'll just say, and this will get my whole family upset, but I'm gonna to have to return to Gentle Wave. And remember, they threatened a lawsuit against us. So that all went away because we said everything correctly on the show and I'm gonna say everything correctly today. It has to do with them. They funded a paper called uh, Inodine healing success rates, uh, I think uh, I can read the exact title. Glory will pro uh, promote it for us. Six-month healing success rates after inodine treatment using the non novel Gentle Wave system. And it was published in the Journal of Clinical Experimental Dentistry in 2016 of July. So what about this? Well, they talked about fast healing. And what I had a problem with in the paper uh, we all know from the very first time you go to grad school, everybody has to do a research project. Some get published and some don't, but we're, you go through the steps, so you learn a lot. And there was no control. So when I say control, they should have, you know, they're very good at describing uh, their exclusion and inclusion category. So we're past all that. And the medical history is all inside that, how they might exclude you if you were an uncontrolled diabetic as an example. But then they did very careful accesses and described that. Uh, how they reach length, working length. They talked about how they shape, so we understood that perfectly. They didn't talk at all about how they irrigated during this opening up the canal to get some kind of a cha shape. And some of you might be misunderstood because you think gentle wave means minimally invasive. This group of scientists at a NYU, they used the F1 pro taper. That's a 2007. And they used that because they wanted to have a standardized cone to fit at the end of the procedure. So it was a 2007. So they explained all that, but they don't explain anything about how they irrigated the frequency, the volume, the temperature, the concentration. None of that's discussed. And then they put the gentle wave on the top of the tooth at the end, and they ran the cycle. So they report at six months, and we'll get into that a little bit later, what the healing looked like. The problem is compared to, as you said earlier, compared to what? And then the other thing is there's no controls. Uh, compare, you know, the controls I just mentioned, I'm sorry, there's no comparisons. Now, they say they did a lot of comparisons, and this is kind of interesting. They looked at a lot of studies around the world where people assessed healing at six months. But the pathway that those clinicians around the world went through in terms of deep shape, the final shape, the irrigation protocol, the concentration, the temperature, all of a sudden, it was different in every study. So here again, you're comparing this study that I just mentioned to all these other studies. Those are called comparisons, but everybody around the world did their procedures differently 
than they did their procedures in this paper. So those aren't even really comparison studies. The only thing you can compare is they did something, you did something, I did something, the producer did something, we did it all differently, and then we're reporting our healing rate. So they're comparing healing, but we don't really know what the comparison was against. What it does seem actually a little bit difficult um, or problematic to say that a single device, okay, well, first of all, irrigation is just one part of root canal treatment, right? There's also shaping and obturation as There's well. There's many, many steps that go into start to finish in a dunx, and irrigation is one single step. So it seems problematic to, to um, associate success to just one technology used in one aspect of the root canal treatment. It just seems that there's a lot of variables that you're trying to control. Um, you're trying to set up an experiment where every, all the technology used and everything done is exactly the same. The only difference being mm -hmm. um, the technology used for or the, the irrigation device. But then again, there's no comparison. Um, I guess they did try to set up an experiment where everything is controlled, right, except the irrigation device, but do you agree with their protocol? Well, no, that's, uh, I'm being redundant to the audience, uh, sorry, but you can do all the things they did. They, they mapped them all out. I used 10 file, working length, pro taper F1 was the finish. We don't know what they irrigated through. They didn't work dry, and that was several minutes of chair time that could already clog up a canal. But then they do use Genoway, which has been said and heralded as a very effective way to clean. And they go into big depths in their paper about other papers they've done or other cohorts of theirs that have done papers. Uh, usually these are people that are on General Wave Scientific Board of Advisors and they're academics. So they quote a lot of these other papers. But again, comparisons, if you do a root canal and compare healing at six months, and I do a root canal at six months, and we show something the same or different, we don't know what it was that was different unless we know what you did exactly that I did. So no comparison. For me, really simple. Do everything they did, every single step, more or less perfect. At the end, no gentle wave versus gentle wave. Now you have a head-to-head -head comparison to see, is this the only factor that made the difference? Because a lot of times people, studies, they attribute success to things that really aren't part of the success story. And I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but but that's what needed to be done. There was no control. That's the biggest thing. And the comparisons they talked about to me are irrelevant because we don't know how those studies were done. I think they actually say at the end of the article that more studies would need to be done and they would need to compare the it, the general wave system um, in the experiment being used in maybe another with other technologies on the market that are currently being used for irrigation. So they didn't even compare not only just general wave versus a control, which I guess would be something like handheld irrigation or something, um, but there was no comparison even to a control or to other disinfection technologies on the market today. And then they looked at it at six months and they said healed or healing, but faster fast healing but there's no comparison so it's just it's 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 not like they even showed faster healing or fast healing they just showed that healing happens i guess well and i guess i want to say this i wasn't part of the paper nor am i but everyone out there that's practicing is their own researcher because your pool of patients that you see every day is giving you a lot of feedback when I heard all this healing, they gave other papers, and some were 50s and 60s and 70%. They were 97 some percent. Well, how did they measure the healing? Well, that was what was kind of crazy. They divided, okay, first of all, they want the patients to come back and they could access them a clinical examination and a radiographic examination. So they did that. And then they divide the groups into three, heal, progressive healing, but unhealed, but progressive, and diseased. So most people were over in these two categories and they said some very nice things about what they found. But within these two categories, you tell the audience what was in both categories that was so alarming. Some sensitivity to percussion. They said that the people in A, heal, the people in progressive healing had sensitivity to percussion. Ronald has never had a patient that's healing that's sensitive to percussion. It doesn't even meet... Any, it, it, it defies everything I know about my experience, but my experience isn't their experience. But one last comment I'd like to make about it. 
most of my patients could eat and chew left to right pretty much the night or within 48 hours after the pack, okay? And I did a, my own study decades ago to demonstrate that because you don't know if it's the sodium hypochlorite that gets out. You don't know if it's the file that pushes debris out. You don't know if it's the sealer. You don't know if it's the gutta percha. You don't know what it is that makes a person hurt. So you got to control everything. And the only difference could be gentle wave mosis versus no gentle wave, no controls. Comparisons are uh, irrelevant. And it doesn't meet my clinical experience. I mean, people, we used to see people, kids heal faster. We were having this big discussion about don't kids heal faster? Well, they control that in their inclusion group. They had ages, uh, I think 18 to 79, something like that across the board. But of course, kids can lay down bone quicker. But I saw people even on their deathbed brought in on gurneys and stretchers to get a recall x-ray. I wasn't even sure why they were there, but we saw healing even on terminally ill patients. So to me, my experience isn't sensitivity to percussion in the heal or progressively healing group. In fact, I'll say progressively bones filling in, the two should be totally comfortable unless there's a, what, a ridiculous a, fracture. If I had a root canal and six months later, I had sensitivity to per percussion, I would definitely consider myself as not healed. And I would be going back to the dentist to try to figure out what was going on. I wanna say something. The paper is not my problem. The paper is just the paper. I've said decades ago, they should have a journal of retractions, okay? So that people have an opportunity to put their journal up and remove it once and for all. The paper is just another paper, okay? And if you don't control things, we don't get upset about it. What is the problem, and going back to almost your first question, is when companies and industry takes these papers and starts using them for promotional pieces to promote uh, their product. And that can send out the wrong message because they say fast healing in the paper, the website says faster healing. Yeah, I so, guess that. I don't know what faster is. I don't know what fast is. I would only know fast if they define slow. And you already made this point. I'd only know fast if you said uh, regular, slow, no. Okay, I get, we get all that, but I don't know what fast. They said fast healing, but maybe fast compared to what? Their experiences. How about that? Okay, say you could prove that it actually is faster healing. So then I'm wondering, like, is this even statistically significant though? Because if you told me that, I, if I, if this technology was used, I could heal in three months versus six months. Hmm. I would say like, wow, it's cutting the healing time. You're in half. Impressed. I'm definitely, yeah. I want to do that. But if you told me what well, used to take 180 days now only takes 177 days to heal. Well, I would kind of think. Would you like, repeat that? Would you repeat that again? That was in the paper. Say it again. Oh, well, I don't know about those numbers. I just actually made it up. But if you could to tell me that what used to take 180 days now only takes 177 days, well, I would not really care too much about those three days as the patient. If you were asymptomatic, because you would know if you're comfortable, probably deep in the bone, the osteoblasts are doing their thing. And then I guess there's also a bit of an issue I, I heard you saying about assessing things at six months and then that being the end of the experiment because um, don't a lot of a lot of um, root canals heal fine in six months, but maybe problems might be down the line? In my experience, and there are plenty of exceptions, but in general, almost anything works for three to five years. So you might have uh, a, a really poorly performed root canal Post-operative, there might be some pain, some swelling, maybe some phone calls, and then they kind of settle down and then they become comfortable. I made a living out of doing a retreatment. I got to a point where 90% of my caseload was people that had already had endodontics. So that's where the three to five years comes from. Almost everything works for three to five years. What separates time, it, a great work, is time. And time really for me is 15, 20, 25, 30 year recalls. Uh, Maybe one last comment about um, what we should look for as colleagues. Uh, we shouldn't really get too overly impressed with uh, statistics, um, with, uh, uh, I guess, indices, tables, uh, references. This paper was very heavily loaded with the best that science can offer in terms of supporting stuff that didn't really answer the question fast, faster than what? Yeah, and I also want to just um, uh, tell our viewers that this is actually, beware of 
seeing a reference slapped on to the end of a statement and thinking, oh, yeah, that's proven. Because just not even in only in dentistry, but in other areas in the last year, there's been many times I've actually gone to look at the reference of what was um, cited. And they're not even saying what the person is like interpreting them to be saying. They're not mm-hmm. even they're not even being properly represented. Is it a to friend? Study. No, it's just other things I've gone to check out. Over <laughs> Sometimes the, we reference over our the friends. Last couple of years, yeah, it seems like it's very become very popular to just slap a reference onto the end of a statement and think that that's going to you know cover it. But if someone goes and reads that paper, then they might be left wondering. Well, I'm just wondering how they got that out of this article because that's not what I got out of it. Well, here let's give them a challenge. I'll shape fifty canals to a 2508 or a 2007. I'll do all my irrigation protocol. And if I do active irrigation after my, let's make a distinction, irrigation protocol versus activating the irrigation protocol. I'd like to see my work head to head with their work. I don't, I would argue because of my experience, I'm gonna be 97, 98%. I mean, so I don't take their claim that the only variable was gentle life. Okay, well, good discussion on fast healing. And I just really want to encourage all of our viewers to just not blindly accept, you know, what you read and and to use critical thinking and and ask yourself, does this even intuitively make sense? Um, Check out, is it supported by um, evidence-based research? That kind of thing. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, and I guess in terms for me, on this show, don't believe anything you see and only half of what you hear. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today again at the board, set B. Uh, This is season nine. This is show eight. This is the last show of this season. Don't be too disgruntled because every ending has a new beginning. I'm really delighted today then to talk to you about something that we haven't really addressed specifically. We've danced all around it. We've talked a lot about glide path managers over many, many episodes. We've talked about irregular glide path management, but I've never tied these three things together. And this is something for the learned clinician, for the novice clinician, and from the kind of experienced clinician. There's something in here for everybody. So we'll look at some different ideas and some concepts obviously, to learn and learn together. Now, I know there's tens of thousands of people that watch these shows, and we're very, very proud of that, and we want to thank you for your participation so authentically. But I like to make it more personal, like I'm talking to you, okay? You're the only one out there, and it's just me and Cliff, and and we're visiting today about a topic. How do we do maybe, say, a cone fit, or how do we do glide path management in the instances of apical divisions? Let's get started. All right. So we have a spinning tooth to remind us of the mandibular bicuspid. Frequently, it's a complicated tooth. It has loops, deltas, extra canals, deep divisions, reanastomosing, and more divisions. So it's a tough tooth, and we have a pretty nice one here to show you. As it comes around, you can see some of the anatomy I just described. So it's always anatomically driven. Endodontics is anatomically driven. So I'm going to look at three cases today, not six, not 10. We'll come back to this topic because we can go to molars and we can go to individual roots, for example. But I'm just going to show three single rooted teeth. They appear to be posterior teeth. And here we go. So when you look at this tooth, um, you all saw the lesion on the molar. Okay, you saw that big lesion down here on the molar. That was asymptomatic, and it's scheduled for treatment. It was going to be treated. The patient was having clinical symptomology with the bicuspid. And you see that first bicuspid has lost its filling because it had recurrent decay. So the patient is complaining of a lot of sensitivity, spontaneous pain, and it's a vital pulp. I always say all that because we know necrotic pulps are easier to eliminate and remove from the root canal system than collagenous tissue, as an example. Tenacious, tacky, sticky, hard to remove. So if you look at the caries, we begin to look at the teeth and we usually try to read canals, you know, preoperative, we try to read canals all the way down and try to see where they might terminate. In the tooth in question, 
I can see a canal coming down nicely, 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 and it kind of plays out. You know, I know, we all know that when canals play out, as we move towards the terminal part of the route, that usually suggests to the clinician a division. So already you're alert to that. With vital tissue, we don't have enough breakdown to know exactly how to pre-curve the file and guide it to a specific site because it hasn't had enough osteolytic activity yet to destroy bone. So these are some of the things Ruddell notices. I have pretty good canal widths, pretty good canal widths, and pretty good canal widths. So I'm looking at this tooth and I'm thinking, what do we do first? Well, I've been teaching for a long time now with new instruments, new cross sections, new geometries, new heat treatment. We can do a lot more than maybe if you heard me five years ago, three years ago. But with the launch of Ultimate, there was a new glide path called Slider. Slider has a different cross section as compared to Gold Glider, which is for the single file wave one technique. Pro Taper Gold had Pro Taper, it had a, you know, glider, and now this is a slider. It has a little different name. You get confused by it, I know. I get confused, and I'm an inventor with my pals, Pierre and John. But you can see it has eight changing tapers. It's a progressively tapered instrument. That was our initial idea. Everybody's copied that now. You can see in the box the numbers, so you can kind of look at the, the cross-sectional diameters as you move up the file to see how big it is. It's one millimeter diameter wire, so that just means that it shuts down at one millimeter, nine nine hundredths right at the last blade. So we have progressive tapers. We have a very nice instrument with good geometries to open up the canal quickly and effectively. And we have a different cross section that balances rigidity and flexibility. It's funny, you talk to dentists, you read magazines, even from other clinicians, and they're always looking for floppy, like wet noodle flexibility. You need to have enough rigidity to hold the cutting edge on your blade so it can cut and move in. So this instrument, the KOLs, the key opinion leaders from around the world, many of them, many of them over several months validated that 63% of the time in posterior teeth, the glider, the slider, the slider will go right to length in two or three passes, okay? So 63% thumbs up. So if that's the case, we know we have a pretty decent canal. I'm not really sure what's gonna happen about right here, but let's get started. Okay, so you're gonna use mechanical instrument. Why not? You come in here, it takes a few seconds, let it float, say float. Can't hear you, float, follow. You float and follow. This is just as kind as if you went down here with a 10 or a 15 and it wouldn't go. It might even be kinder because usually manually you try to, there's this tendency to try to force it a little bit. So. If you just let it float in, as long as it's moving and progressing apically, stay the course. If it seems like it might be because of debris loaded on the flutes, take the file out, clean the blades and let it go. But if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. Either disarticulate this file from the hand piece and take a film or take the file out, throw in a hand file. That's what I did. And yep, goes right to what you might think, right to what you might think. So you can then push the stop down. And if you thought for uh, uh, an example that this thing might have been 23 millimeters, we know that about 17 millimeters, there is an impediment. This is where we would have the impediment. So you can put a different instrument in there and let's see if we can get a little bit deeper. But when you're stuck, don't try to go deeper. What do we always say? Pre-enlarge, open up the body. This is the most used instrument internationally. I guess I'll say this for general white people. I get paid a royalty on these files that I helped invent along with my colleagues. Uh, they brought that up, you know, and we'll talk about that later. But yes, I need to say that I'm a co-inventor on these instruments. And this instrument, Shaper X, it's different than the Shaper X from the Pro Taper Gold family. It's different than from the Pro Taper Universal family. Pro Taper Ultimate has a new cross section. In any event, this is uh, the geometries as you move up the file. Oftentimes, Ruddle only puts the file in about halfway. Um, 
Well, let me change this. Uh, you might not know this. You're thinking every file has 16 millimeters of active portion. Actually, SX has about 14 millimeters. So half of 14 sounds like it's about seven. So about seven millimeters up, we're probably about a 77, okay? So what this does is it rapidly opens up the body and by pre-enlarging the canal, we create space and now we can take a little small hand file and we can pre-curve it and we can drop a pre-curved file in a pre-enlarged canal. How about that? And when we arrive at the impediment, we have a curved file. If we don't pre-enlarge, there's so much restriction that we can curve the file, but as we pass it through the restrictive area, the curve is knocked off the file and the file arrives unintentionally straighter than you believed. So open it up. I've shown this clip before. I've seen lots of other companies, what they call orifice openers. They're stiff. Look how flexible this is. It's sloppy flexible, but it has big geometries. And I only run it in about halfway, just about halfway. And by opening it up, I can take a 10 file and I can slide it where it wouldn't go before because the rate of taper of the 10 file early was greater than the taper of the canal. So it wouldn't go. A lot of you drop to the eight and the six then. We just simply open it up, take the same file, and you can see we got it registered and it's sneaking through and we're open and patent. So that's a quick way, a quick trick to get to length is pre-enlargement. This we have talked about several times. But back to our bifidity, you can get your 10 file, you can put a curve on it like I just mentioned, you can pass it through that pre-enlarge region, you'll arrive in the curvature curve, and then it's a lot of watching this little unidirectional stop. That little unidirectional stop tells you if you're going north, east, west, or south. Maybe you're going southwest, but you can find the vector, the pathway to the terminus. And once you get in, we talked about that in a previous show. I think it was show five this year, but we talked about the finger motion, the watch winding motion in the apical one third. And that's what draws that file down and to length. When you get to length, it's in, out. You change the motion of your fingers. No more watch winding. It's in, out, in, out, in, out until the file is. Oh, yes. Loose. If you start working with loose tens, your endodontics all gets easier and better and more fun. All right. So you're at length and you're actually open and patent. You've confirmed patency. It was already patent before Ruddle. It should still be patent after Ruddle. So that's that branch. You can take a film and say, there it is. So we still know the impediment's about right here. And there we are heading off to the distal. Just keep your eye on this. There's a little bundle down in here. There's a, a little anterior shunt on that neurovascular bundle. And we have close root in proximity to a neurovascular network. Okay. What do we do next? Take it out. Let's take it out. And take the same instrument that's pre-curved. The curve is much closer to the tip. It's not a sweeping curve like in the envelope of motion up in the body. This curve moves towards the terminal part of the file, two, three, four flutes. And now you can begin to try north, try south, try east. If you get a little catch, the tendency is to pull out. If you get a little bit of pressure, the tendency is to pull out and go in eight. Don't go to an eight unless you have it open and you've identified this orifice and you can get into it on a deliberate and reproducible basis. On your way down, you go in and out. Ruddle says do that to smooth, expand, and refine and give yourself a greater opportunity on the next sequential file to get right back in there. West, John West calls those smoothies. But when you're down and you're at length, you take a film and you can see we are working a bifidity. So we're talking about apical divisions. Now, sometimes you don't even know this is here. A lot of us don't ever get into it. We just work the more apical branch. That's fine because if you're using active irrigation, a lot of times we can clean laterally, okay, where our files never reach. Another thing, it's nice to get in here because when you start to open canals and you start to shape canals, 
you shorten the length of the lateral anatomy. You shorten the length of the lateral anatomy. And by shortening the length, it's easier to clean. So we don't always even get into them. So some of you are saying, well, gee, I've never been in a bifidity in my life. Well, a lot of us haven't been, but some of us have. And so I'm saying, if you do get that catch, this is what it means. Think about it. Now you can imagine it, and now you can reproduce what Ruddle's just talking about. This is all reproducible. So you got in here, and you're thinking, I'm ready to go to something different. But if 10 file was the first hand file you used, you're going to want to go to the slider. And you could try it rotary, but it'll probably still hang up right at the bifinity, so we know that we can clip a handle on. A manual instrument that's working, about four millimeters this and about four or five that way, do you realize how fast that is? Do you know your finger? You can, before you can chuck this up and put it in and start to discover everything, you've already done it manually. So don't dismiss manual instrumentation in specific kinds of cases. I'm showing you this slide because you could think, well, I already have a 10, it's purple. Well, you could say I go to the next instrument in the ultimate family, or maybe I go to a shaper in another family, or I go to a finisher in another family, or the pro taper family. But I need you to go back and use this instrument. This instrument must be used because look at the difference. It's about 60% different at D0. It's about 44% different at D4. So you can see this instrument's doing a lot of progressive work. You don't want the instrument to do too much work. You want it to do its fair share of work. So you divide the workload out over two, three, four instruments. So now you're going to use that one. You can pre-curve these and go back and watch a previous show. Yes, you can use the apical file bender. You can, you can use the orthodontic bird beaks pliers. You can put a nice curve on night tie. It'll hold it if you know how to do it and if you have the right design of an instrument. So basically... You have this catheterized, you have working length, and you have patency. Things are starting to get all together now. So now you're coming in, it's gonna be easier to get in there. Remember a 10 file up about four millimeters, that's a 10, a tenth of a millimeter, D0, 12, 14. It's about 16, it's about 16 or 18 up there. And if you're doing some smoothies, it's getting a little bit bigger and you're refining a little bit more, it might be almost approaching a 20. Well, now it's pretty easy to get in there every time. And then of course, you can take the same instrument, again, pre-curved, and again, because you've mapped it in your head previously with a 10 manual file, you'll now take that action to your manual slider. Now, when you start to get to this point in treatment, you start thinking ahead, don't you? You're like most of us, you're going, start with the end in mind. How am I gonna fit a cone in here? Can I clean it okay? Can I even shape both branches? Is there one branch that's more straightforward? These are all decisions that Ruddle makes. A lot of times one branch will just be, your file will just fumble into that easier and the other one takes a little bit more intentionality to direct the terminal part of that file into that other branch. So in those instances, you might just say, this is my primary canal and I won't really do any more enlargement I won't do any more enlargement on that branch because that will be my secondary branch and I'll use sealer in there and I can get some warm gutta percha with vertical condensation and I can get some GP warm in here. I can have my cone fit down here and I might be pushing sealer on out past this piston of warm thermal softened gutta percha and as it drives the hydraulics, you'll get up the puff, boom. So Schiller used to say, don't worry about what's in the lateral branches. Sometimes it's all got a percha. Sometimes it's a mixture of got a percha sealer. And sometimes in the smaller ones, it's all sealer. So these are, uh, this is a decision tree right here. So I fit the cone to the longer branch. That was this one right here. That was where the master cone would go pretty easy every time. And I didn't have it hit the septum trip and roll over. You've had that happen. And now the cone's not to link. The cement's starting to set up and the patient's tired. And oh my, you gotta take that cone out and you gotta fit a new cone and it's not, not fun. So you might just think about fitting the cone to the longer branch. Realize when you down pack using the shoulder technique, 
the worm gonna perch you? Where you fit the cone and where the canal, the foramen's more round, you have a theoretically round gutta percha cone, you get just a little sealer puff. Where you don't fit cones, where you don't fit cones, you're gonna have a little bit of GP certainly, but you're gonna have sealer and you'll have a bigger puff because you're not gonna get the control you'd give with a cone fit. Now, some of you could even squirt this. So we're talking about ideas. We could have fit uh, gutta percha master cone, I did. We could have even squirted. That was another idea you could have done. You could have put a cannula deep into this preparation and squirted. I'll say one thing. If you're going to squirt, take your last file that easily got to length, pick up a little bead of sealer, and go down deep and go one way and go the other way, streaking some sealer on both. The sealer reduces surface tension because warm got to purchase sticky and tacky. And I'm talking to you, just remember that 101. So we're just having that easy conversation. Where's your coffee? Okay, so uh, lubricate. So when you tacky, sticky, get a perch, it hits that area, it can slide and it can move and you won't be disappointed. Little trick, carry sealer into the lateral branch was the trick, manually. Streak it. And then backpack and there's your case. So that was an example fitting one cone, but working two branches, working one branch a little more than the other and keeping the secondary branch just a little bit smaller. Now we can go quite quick as we finish up. Okay. Yep, nice shape. You know, they always talked about when, you know, God makes canals, they're usually about one third, maybe one fifth, of the total mesial dimensions of the CEJ. And so minimally invasive dentistry has gotten really excited about this. I look at some of my cases that were done 25, 30 years ago, and I'm going, I hope this is okay for the minimally invasive boys. We're still not one third, one third, one third, and we got a nice residual circumferential dentin structure to help support the load above. Let's look at the next case quickly. So we got a bridge, maybe you see this, maybe you don't, but there's carries under here. So we have a problem with this abutment. Uh, you look, you see chambers, you see, it looks like a pin's in the chamber. I doubt it's in the chamber. It's probably lateral to the chamber. We got chambers, but you kind of see the canal pinches off about right in here, gets kind of small. Everybody says, oh yeah, there's an apical lesion. But you know what? How many of you saw this one? See that? If you look at your films with a more discerning eye, you can begin to see things other than lesions at the apex. Lesions occur circumferentially or periradically around the roots. Also, again, try to find the canal, got a little tighter in here, and then in the apical third, I don't even see a canal, so I'm thinking it probably branches. So you take off part of the bridge. I'm in here with two files, go left, go right. I blocked, in this case, the trick is, I blocked one branch to try to get another file to go into the empty space that was left. So that's how we did that. And both files are at length. They're probably a little bit long. So I love that because that means I'm Peyton. Make a flow channel. Look, if we're going to brag about 3D disinfection, all the contemporary and all the traditional weapons being used today around the world, they all work better when there's a flow path. So you can brag all you want and tap and pat your back and do hugs, you know, and really feel good about yourself. You cleaned out a counter, you never put a file in. Yeah, that can happen. Feel very lucky. It's much better to catheterize that canal and have a flow channel. Then you can go forward. Here we are down packing. I down packed right up to here. I've backpacked, put a piece in, put another piece in, put another piece in. That's a post space for the referring dentist. But we down pack out with those branches and notice that lateral canal with that button and it's boom, 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 right on the heart of that lesion, right in the heart. The lesions form adjacent to the portals of exit. And which one's important? This one looks about as big in its size as the one I put files in. So, and everybody thinks these lateral canals don't matter. I keep hearing this and I keep reading about it. What world do they practice in? Have they ever practiced? Did you hear that? I was talking to you personally and you're going, yeah, Cliff, I practice all the time. 
Maybe we're not talking about you. All right, so let's get this one done. New post, new bridge. Retreatment's very, it's very expensive. Retreatment is very, very expensive when you have to redo things. Let's do them right. So bridges, post. Notice all the PDL. Look at it, it's all in there. Beautiful bones butted up. Bones coming in apically, bones coming in laterally. Wow, it's a perfect world. It's a perfect world, apically and lateral healing. Last case, real quick, look at the size of this root. Now, I saw this uh, case many years ago, and I was reading on the AAE discussion forum, and there was a whole bunch of discussions about these so-called J-shaped lesions. Oh, my goodness, those J-shaped lesions have been thought to be fractured roots. And then all these people came out of the woodwork and they said, no, it's only suspicious if it's a J-shaped lesion around a previously treated tooth. That was a good distinction. On virgin teeth, you're obligated to get in here. This thing probes all the way to the apex. So that's the first thing I want you to see is not condemn the tooth because it's fractured. Let's just do a little pulp testing. This is vital. This is vital. And this is, necro this is necrotic, okay? So we have reason to go in. And I want you to look at the dimensions of the root. I want you to look at the dimensions and the length. This is a massive root. It's right out of a chimpanzee, maybe. I was very afraid of this patient. They had a very big tooth, and I was afraid they might be very mean, and their meanness might be commensurate with the size of their tooth. No, they were a nice patient. All right, so here you are, and I'm showing you now fitting two cones. And you're gonna go, well, wait a minute, how do you do that? Well, let's take a page out of the old playbook. Everything old is still relevant sometimes. Sometimes it's still nice to have that old fashioned training from the past because new kids really don't think about this stuff. They really don't. So how did we fit two cones and pass it through the body and not overshape the canal and remember minimally invasive and loads and occlusal loads and is a tooth gonna break? Let's think about all that. And here's the solution. You have system-based gutta percha master cones. You know that, I know that. And you're thinking, I'll just grab one of those because the last file length, it'll have a cone that will be commensurate with that size. That's good. But it will occupy all the body, which means you'll either have to carry sealer in here like we've talked about. You could squirt it. You could use a carrier-based obturator my producer will say, why didn't you mention that earlier? Vertical, CBO, squirt. You have three ideas down here. But I like to fit a cone. But you need another idea, don't you? And the other idea is in special situations, you need to think about the past. In the past, they made non-standardized gutta percha master cones. Okay? But this is the key word. And they came in size fine, fine medium fine, fine, fine medium, medium, medium large, and large. Some of you old timers remember that. I'm grabbing the fine cone. Look at how skinny it is. Now you're gonna say, well, wait a minute. These non-standardized cones, they come right to a point. And they were called gutta percha points instead of gutta percha cones. These are cones, this is a point, gutta percha point. So what you do is you get the little jig as an example, from MyFair, they're owned by Desly Serona, and they have this little MyFair jig. It has holes at one end, they're very small, and it has holes at the other end, they're very large. Just stick this cone through to coincide with the last file you carry to link. If it was a pro taper, 25, if it's 2508, okay, red, then stick it through the 25 hole, use a scalpel, whatever you use, fingernail, gloved, and trim it off and it'll be perfect. And once you get that done, you'll have a cone that is exactly corresponding to your apical length that you carry to file. Now notch the cone. Don't notch the cone, typically with pliers across the whole cone. Just get half the cone. Just get half the cone. Why? The notch serves two purposes. It gives you the length of the canal but it gives you like your rubber stop on your file. It gives you a unidirectional mark to help you guide the cone in. So a lot of you are going, well, this is just fabulous, Cliff, but it's a straight cone. 
Well, I know you curve your cones. I curve my cones, so put a curve on it. Just take your fingers and rub it through your glove fingers and put a nice sweeping curve on it. See? Kind of looks just like that, doesn't it? Looks just about like that. So you do that. Well, Cliff, how do you how do you hold the curve? Well, you use isopropyl alcohol. For you chemists out there, you got the formula, right? So isopropyl, 70% isopropyl alcohol. If you put the cone in it for five seconds, the cone will get decidedly more rigid, way more rigid than a master cone out of the box. And now when you butter this cone with sealer and you start to put it in at 17 millimeters on the other case or whatever this example is, you take the curve so it's headed away from the other branch and direct it to come this way. And if you direct the cone to come this way, you can bypass the septum and steer it right into the other branch. So that's the alcohol trick. And then you can down pack and get right down there and move warm thermal softened gutter purchase sealer complex into the anatomy. You can backpack and you can watch the bone heal. So there we are. And, uh, you can see big, broad roots. Sometimes you have permission in big, broad roots. They have more bulk, more form. You can make a little bigger shape. You can fit two system-based cones. But now you have an idea that if you can't get the body open for whatever reason, and you want longevity out of this too, so it can't be weakened, then you can fit a smaller cone. It's in as a non-standardized word. Last case. I won't show anything more than this, but you probably saw this. You probably saw this. You probably saw a big lesion there. You probably saw the open margin. So we have to disassemble. Remember, repeated dentistry is expensive dentistry. Notice the significant branch right out to that big lesion. Notice we had a bifidity. We've been talking about this all day. We don't worry about that bifidity because that bifidity is so small we wouldn't get into it. And if you did, you'd have to be Houdini. And then, of course, you got to trust your reagents, your active irrigation protocols. They'll get most of this stuff, even in spite of our deficiencies. So I hope you've really enjoyed this session. I hope you've understood that we have things to think about in the instance of apical divisions. See you next season. so that's a wrap on season nine thanks for watching yeah thanks a lot for joining us over the shows some of you are new and some of you are just discovering us but regardless the show is supposed to make you laugh a little bit we want to inspire you ever closer to what you are supposed to be doing on this earth and of course there should be an educational value and uh i hope we've done that across the season and i look forward to season 10 Okay, coming back to the laughter part, we're going to leave you with some bloopers, as you can see from this sign behind us. It might be really hard for you to imagine that we even have bloopers, but we do. So we'll leave you with those and see you next season in the fall, Three, season 10. Two, one. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How you doing, Lizette? <laughs> I think we do it again, right? Because it's a tough word for me. I've never heard of that. Never heard of my daughter before. Plus, it was Lisa. I would say I life. would say hi, everyone, first, and then say hi to me. Hi out hi. there, everybody. Great season plan of eight shows. We, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. okay, keep it live. All right, how are you? We're telling jokes on the set, so we better get serious. Okay, so to start, I we have, um, okay, never mind. Good to have you with us again, and I guess we'll get going and start talking about things I'm wearing. Well, faith in humanity. Mm -hmm. All right, well, hang on. Uh, I have a hair or something in my lipstick. One sec. <laughs> Why don't we just keep going live? To see if um, the case is simple or wait, okay. 
that seem difficult, but are they? So let's go to the board. Let's make the easy cases difficult. <laughs> How about that one? And I'm gonna pedal and go for it. Yo! That may initially seem simple, but are they really? Let's go find out. Okay. So let's go to the board. All right, today we are introducing a new segment, which will be recurring, hopefully, if, if this goes well today. <laughs> I'm gonna take it off the air. Are we censored already? How you doing out there? I hope everybody's ready for the show. Number 80. Okay, well, well, wait, okay, I think it's 82. Oh, it's 82. You look good, you, you have great energy. Cameras. Yeah, I'll, I didn't even remember I had a camera. Yeah, it hasn't really changed for Ruddle. Um, great camera, booth. Anyway, <laughs> how you doing? Glad to be here. Good to see you. Start over again. Okay. What was I supposed to say? <laughs> Those types of the stuff you just said. Oh. All right. Today we're gonna talk about obturation. <laughs> Oh, hold it. I think I should say I'm Cliff Ruddle. Minimally invasive dentistry and making people happy. System shut down.